stay tuned to hear a very special live performance from this episode's guest. And so at that point, I thought, right, well, that lifestyle's got to go. So it did. No matter what I give, it's never enough. Guildhall, that is on my bucket list. But I didn't read or write music. I got in because of my performance experience, because obviously I've been performing for like 20 years. And I came out of some of those lessons thinking, you've just given me a handful of diamonds. Hi, I'm Claire, founder of Open Stage Arts Drama and Singing Classes for Adults. For this podcast, I chat with people who have found or refound their creativity as adults. We'll explore their childhood experiences of the arts, discuss how they came to the artistic practices they now love, and consider the barriers they may have experienced between the two. We'll also explore what it is that people value and gain from their newfound artistic pursuits and how their creative lives enrich their practical, necessary, everyday lives. For this episode, I'm speaking with Maxine Ryan, who gave up her youthful party lifestyle so that she could look deep within herself and focus on her music. Hi, Maxine. Hello. You call your creative pursuit your God job, using that term to mean a spiritual calling, not necessarily related to a particular religion. What is your God job? Well, for me, I feel that it's singing. When I use the term God, it's like it's an um, it's an umbrella term. I don't follow any particular religion or anything like that. I was brought up Catholic. But what I mean by that is it's my calling. It's my purpose. It's my vocation. I've been singing for around, uh, yeah, about 20 years. And I made that decision to sing that time ago. And since then, I just feel that it's what I'm on this earth to do. And I like to think that when I sing, it creates good vibrations within people, whether it's uh, to help people relax or chill out or to excite with the more up-tempo numbers. But I really do believe that singing and uh, using my voice is my God job. And that is also because of the amount of, oh, God, changes and everything that I've been through since making that decision uh, 20 years ago to uh, become a singer. That's beautiful. Thank you. So we're going to hear more on that whole story as we progress. But let's start with your childhood. And did music and the arts play a role in your upbringing? Music? I would say so, because I was uh, initially influenced by the music that was around me. So it'd be my mum's Motown or the last end of disco. So I was brought up listening to that sort of music, um, which I loved. And then in terms of sort of other forms of creativity, I said my mum's pretty creative. She was always making things and my mum and my dad had this frame making business amongst other things. So, yeah, I would say so. What about at school? Oh, God, no, no, <laughs> absolutely not. Because it was, I, I was rubbish at uh, music and I had an, a, a block with regards to the, you know, the, the reading of the notes and stuff. I mean, I did used to play the recorder and I would drive my mum and my stepdad nuts because I was always doing this London's burning, <laughs> London's burning, fire, fire, you know, on the recorder. They'd make me go down to the bottom of the of the garden and sit on the wall. So, um, but the, my singing, t- it was just very old fashioned and crotchets and the quavers, you know, the dots. I just, I, could, I just couldn't do it. Yeah, that's understandable. When you left school, did you have a career or a life plan in mind? Absolutely not. I was clueless. I was rudderless. I was hopeless. Um, <laughs> I was, no, I mean, in my, uh, in my sort of late teenage years, I was all over the shop. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I was studying A-levels, but at that time in my life, what was very important to me was uh, nightclubs and going out and boozing and having fun and meeting fellas and all those sorts of things. So a career or a vocation, I mean, what, 
what's that? That came to me a lot later, about a couple of years later. And it came after I had, uh, the only way I can describe it was a spiritual awakening. Okay, so then what kind of things were you doing before this spiritual awakening? How were you getting by? Oh, what, what how, where I was working and stuff like that? Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, I was doing my A-levels, but then... I stopped doing those because I kept going out and I got grounded. And then my uh, parents were like, right, if that's how you want to behave, then you're going to go and get a job. So I got a job and I think I worked in local government for a while. And I was just doing those sorts of things. I lived in Portugal for a couple of years. I went to Portugal. I fell in love in, you know, went to see my auntie in Portugal and didn't come back for two years, as you do. <laughs> uh, I fell in love with a wonderful man who was actually a musician, funnily enough. But I hadn't really come into contact with my true creativity then. It was only when I came back and I started working on myself. And then I came to the realisation that, yeah, I wanted to be a singer. So you had an epiphany moment regarding yes. your, your purpose in life. Tell me more about that. Well, it was so when I came back from uh, Portugal, I was very much involved in the rave scene. I absolutely loved it. For me, it's the music, the music, the music, the music. And also initially the happy vibe that was in those places, which did change later. And that's why I sort of stopped going. But I was introduced to this psychologist, I suppose, that specialised in relationships. And I went on a weekend workshop. And the only way I can describe it is like a, a life transforming weekend workshop. And it, in that weekend, the penny just it just dropped. Something changed in my psyche um, about life. And then I went on a few more. And then I actually went on a two week intensive course in Hawaii. And it was like this global summit where all of these people came from all over the world in order to, you know, to really look at ourselves, our psyche, our past, our relationships, all of those things. And it was just before I flew out to that event that I thought, oh, that's it. Oh, I want to be a singer. I want to be a singer. And then that was the start of my journey. Wow. Well, talking about the journey then, once you had this realisation, you started trying to become a singer with various ups and downs. What did you do immediately after the epiphany moment? OK, so when I came back from that Hawaii trip, I thought, right, what am I going to do? And then I think I was around 25. So believe it or not, in the pop world, 25, I think, is quite old, I think. I didn't really realise that at the time. It's only now as I'm, I'm going on. But thankfully, I, I sing soul and, and jazz and R&B and they're sort of timeless. So I will be singing until I can no longer sing, which I hope is going to be my 80s or 90s, if, if, if even longer. So what did I do? I came back. I did it. I did this demo. I started contacting managers and stuff like that. I did loads of open mics. It definitely started, you know, sort of like that ballsy part of me definitely started. Um, but sort of I still had quite a party lifestyle that I would dip in and out of. And it was only, again, a few years later that the point came and I just thought, I cannot live this lifestyle and become a singer. It's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. And so at that point, I thought, right, well, that lifestyle's got to go. So it did. How did you change your life then after you had that realisation? Well, I, I stopped going to raves. And not that they were raves anymore. It was just like nightclubs and stuff like that. I, was just, I stopped going out in that way. I stopped drinking. There was a whole group of friends and associates that are lovely, lovely people. But I knew that if I continued in that sort of circle, then my behaviour would continue. So I just extricated. Is that a word? Mm. Yeah. Is that and is that the right word for that sentence? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. When you take yourself, yourself out. out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, if that is the right word, extricated, and you can leave that in. I'm not proud. <laughs> right. um, then I thought, right, I've got to, you know, I've got to, I've got to take myself out of this. 
And so I did. And then I just started on this very, very deep journey of inner work, you know, of looking at myself, looking at my behavior, looking at my past, looking at my upbringing, looking at my relationships and just working on all of that sort of stuff. And that's what I did. And how did that help you or how did that help you musically? Well, because then I wasn't I wasn't having these, um, you know, these big raucous nights out that were kind of like these explosions in my life. So it was kind of like there was sort of two parts to me. There's this very healthy, deeply spiritual, clean living woman. And then there's this other side, which I call the beast, you know, that likes to go out and party and have fun. and that, Which is great. That's a wonderful side of me. But that side was stopping Lots of stuff because I, how I explain it is I'd have these explosions every couple of weeks and then I'd go one step forward, two steps back. It's binging, it's binging. I was a binge drinker. So when that stopped, I didn't have those explosions going on anymore. Getting, having all that aspect out of my life just made things easier. And then, you know, I started singing in gospel choirs. I released a couple of dance tracks. They were included in some compilation albums, which was just brilliant. And then I just started gigging. And then I, my ears started to get more sophisticated. And I started doing jazz or learning jazz. I mean, my God, jazz is such an intricate and sophisticated art form. I'm still very much a beginner. Even though I have a master's in jazz voice, I still consider myself very much a beginner in terms of jazz because that is just a whole different ball game (laughs) and while this is going on we know that often artists of whatever discipline need to be earning money in a different way yeah how are you getting by well and this is another thing is that I've done many things many many things over the years some promotional work and yeah just all sorts of stuff but then I was an office manager and then I was um, promoted to be a head of service for a really large FE company, like a couple of, we had sites, you know, 14,000 learners, a staff body of over 200. I had a massive team. And yeah, that was just so intense. And I had the terminology is that stretching targets with, you know, some really, Oh, some really big deliverables, shall we say. So that was a huge job that I had. And I was there for about eight years. And I'd say for seven years, I loved it. Every day was just it, it really intense. You know, you, I'd never knew what was going to happen. As I said, I, I led a very large team. I was responsible for um, all of the customer services, all of the inbound and outbound calls the reception centers I mean it's my a head of service is a huge job and if you can work in a senior position like I was in FE you can do anything um but then the last year of that it was just crisis management every day and I just thought this is this is affecting my happiness here so I can't I need to do something and I really did feel like I was getting backed into a corner not not by any it it was like my sense was I was getting backed into a corner because the workload was getting bigger and my team was getting smaller and me I'm a complete finisher so there's no way I'm going to let something fall I would literally you know it was like I was holding a drinks tray whilst doing a marathon and I was not allowed to spill any of those drinks that's what it got to be like And that, of course, took up masses of energy of mine. Uh, At the same time, I've always done sort of two things. And for a very long time, I thought I'd cracked it, Claire. I really did. I thought, my God, I have orchestrated. I'm not married and I don't have kids. And that's that's fine. That's that's what I've orchestrated. I wouldn't mind being married, but I, I never really wanted children. I thought I'd cracked it. I thought, right, I've got I've got my big job you know, that I love, I'm well paid, it's really exciting, I've got my gigs at the weekend, some in the week, I go to the gym, I've got a really nice lifestyle, as I said, I've got no other responsibilities, all my money's for me, I have cracked it, gym in the week, yoga, fantastic, and I lived like that for quite a number of years, and I I was really, really happy, I'd go on wonderful holidays, and look forward to coming back 
from holidays. I think I've got a really great life to come back to. You know, it was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. But then the last year, as I said, it turned and it was just awful. And I just thought, I can't do this anymore because no matter what I give, it's never enough. I um, I just thought, right, someone's got to give. And I thought, right, Guildhall, Guildhall, that is on my bucket list. Rightly or wrongly, I spent all my life savings. But I just thought, you know what? I've got one life. I don't want to get to 70. Oh, I could have done that. I could have done that. No way. I just thought, you know what? Do it. So that's what I did. I, I was backed into a corner. I knew I had to change because I was going into work, eat, drinking loads of coffee every day just to get me through the day. And I just thought, I'm going around in bloody circles here. It's the same stuff every day. Crisis management every day. This is... This is not me. This is not my life. This is not how I choose to live my life. I'm really organised and on the ball. I'm not doing it. So I resigned and I got a place in Guildhall. Well, exactly. So you studied for a master's in jazz voice at Guildhall School of Music and Drama yes. as a mature student. Why did you choose to go there and what was your experience like? Oh, my God. I mean, anyone who goes to Guildhall, I'm sure, will give you the response. Oh, oh. Um, OK, so first of all, the reason why I went there was because it's been on my bucket list for a very, very long time. I did a summer school there. They did like a week summer course, which I went on. And so I knew some of the, the tutors there. And one of the tutors who I love dearly, Lee Gibson, I'm sure she won't mind me naming her. She, she really inspired me. So I did that for a week, had a wonderful time. In the Barbican is like this um, a water bit. And I just remember sitting there and we just had this conversation and I just said, you know, I'd really love to do the course. And she just, well, you know, just apply, think about how you can do it. You know, just think about the practical thing. You know, how are you going to pay for it? Yeah, you know, are you going to get in and out of it? Anyway, seven years later, I did it, yeah. So that was from that conversation with Lee, that was placed in my mind. I saved up, all, you know, a fair bit of money. And then when all that happened at work, I just thought, right, I'm going to do it. I've got the money. I'm going to at least apply. So I applied and I got in, but I didn't read or write music. I got in because of my performance experience, because obviously I've been performing for like 20 years. So that's what got me in. Um, but my experience of Guildhall was just, oh, like most people say, the best time of my life and the worst time of my life. It was so challenging. It was so, so challenging on so many levels. One, because I was a mature student. Two, because I didn't read or write. You, I mean, look, I could get round a chart, but there was no, if you put a score in front of me and said, OK, you ready? I want two. I want, let's go. I'll be like, ooh, ooh. Ah, you know, it would. Uh, that is not one of my strong points, first to admit that. But I do have a good ear and I've got a lot of experience performing and I do feel very comfortable on stage as long as I'm prepared. And so, yeah, so it was very, very challenging and I had no idea what was in store for me. I mean, obviously, Guildhall has got this reputation, you know, it's a world class, it's a world renowned conservatoire and it certainly lived up to its reputation in terms of a, a, a conservatoire education where the rigour is just intense and also the expectations are very, very high because the expectations, they want you to be world class, you know. So the standard of the tuition, I mean, what these tutors, I don't think there's anything about music they do not know. They are just utterly exquisite and they really, well, the, certainly the tutors I had and my one-to-one -one professors that I had, all they wanted was the best for me, you know, and I came out of some of those lessons thinking, you've just given me a handful of diamonds. You've given me a handful of diamonds. And uh, yeah, so I just want to give a shout out to Lee Gibson, Tina May, Lyon Carroll. Uh, let's I always call her Lyon, Leanne, Leanne Carroll. That's a joke I had with her. And uh, Malcolm Edmondson, you know, and there's loads more, but they really... Um, yeah, they really made my time special. 
Oh, that's brilliant. It's so good that it was something that you'd wanted to do for such a long time and it lived up to that for you. The experience was as super as you had perhaps imagined it would be. And one more name check, uh, Sarah Coleman. She was another shooter, so I just needed to make sure I included them all. If there's anyone else I forgot, then I (laughs) apologise. That's brilliant. I love sharing my guests' stories with you. But podcasting isn't cheap. There are hosting fees and software costs, tech to buy and time to invest in planning and editing to make sure the guests sound great and listeners hear the best content. If you would like to financially support Creativity Found, please visit ko-fi.com slash creativityfoundpodcast. So on graduation, armed with this very prestigious qualification, Did you move easily and comfortably straight into a glorious musical career? No, (laughs) I did not (laughs) at all. I experienced what's known as burnout. So I was at Guildhall for two years. The first year was to do the certificate and then the next year was to do the master's proper because I do not have a degree and I don't have a degree in music. So I was classed as a non-standard entrant. I went into burnout because what had happened was I'd come out of that really intense, stressful, big job, if you like, gone straight into Guildhall. Me and my naivety, I was thinking, oh, I'll have to go and do a bit of studying. I'll have time. I could go do me yoga, do me little swim. Forget it. In some ways, Guildhall was even more stressful than the job I just left, that big job I just left, because there was no time, no time. I mean, I'd be learning things on the tube in, I'd be learning things on the tube out, I'd be have to get in there at, say, 8, 9, 10 in the morning, I wouldn't leave till 8, 9, 10 at night, and then you've got to come home and study for a couple of hours for the next... It was intense, and with the added pressure of not reading and writing music <laughs> which is my fault should have done it you know and but I mean oh god or not to the standard that perhaps I should have so it was just so stressful I mean and thank god for technology thank god for Sibelius I mean my god that was a lifesaver which is a music program name check <laughs> yeah I got through but what happened at the end I was just beyond exhausted because I'd done two years at Guildhall which is just insane to do that two years full time at Guildhall I also did a project in the summertime called 90 gigs in 90 days uh, which is basically like doing a world tour a friend of mine said you you do realize you've done the equivalent to like a world tour and I was just like oh and then I, I didn't know this thing that I was doing so I'm always working on myself that I was having this very deep sort of therapy And it should have only lasted a year, but the process that I got in ended up lasting two years. So all the time I was in Guildhall, in addition to everything else, I was having this deep therapy that was just opening me up. So, you know, I'd be dealing with something in the morning to do with my past and then I'd have to go and do a blooming concert and then get marked on it. So it was so stressful. And all of that, two years of that, I was just spent, I was in a really bad way, a really bad way. I'd pushed myself too far. One that I have many defects, many, many good things about me and also many defects. One of them, I forget that I'm human and I push and push and push and push um, because I suppose I want to achieve. Maybe I've tried too hard. I, I don't know, but that's definitely a defect of character of mine, of my many defects of character. And, yeah, I'd push myself too far. So I would say I couldn't work for about six months. I was in really serious burnout. And mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially, I was... (laughs) 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 So, yeah, fill in the blank. Um, Yeah, so that was a very, very tough time. Really tough you just said about your defects. Do you think that has taught you and you have learnt from it not to overdo stuff in the future? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I can look back at that and see how nuts that is. 
But my reasoning at the time was I'd already started that therapy, so I couldn't sort of stop it halfway in between. I'm not going to be able to do the 90, 90 gigs in 90 days because I'm I'm going to go and get another job after this. I'm under no illusions that, you know, most musicians have to do two things. They either have their music and they teach or have their music and they have another job. It's just unless you're of the, the I don't know, the top 1% that don't. So I, that was my reasoning behind doing all of those things at the same time. Like, listen, I'm not sure we have another full-on job this time next year. So, so you got the, you got the time now. Get on with it, you know. But it, it, that was too much. I mean, that would have pushed anyone to the edge. And I really did push myself to the edge. And if it wasn't for the help of friends and family, I really could have gone under. I really could have. How, how did you recover? Time. It was just time. So I didn't work for six months after that. I couldn't work. I was just all over the shop. I mean, mentally, as I said, physically, and also the most frightening thing, Claire, was knowing I'd spent all my life savings and being too exhausted to go out and earn. Oh, my God, I've spent all my money. Oh, my God, I've got debts. I've got student money. Oh, Jesus. So, yeah, in the pack, right, go and get a job. Come on, up you get, off now. You know, I'll just... And I was like, I, I, I can't, I, I can't. Like, that was a very, very scary, scary place to be. Um, so I didn't work for six months. And thankfully, I got help from my mum and my dad. And yeah, pe- people did did help me. I'm very grateful for that. But I was not in a good way for a, a good six months. And, and even after that, when I did start working and stuff again, for a couple of days a week, I did some consultancy for an old boss of mine, thankfully. It still took a while. It still, it wasn't just the right, great, I'm okay now, let's go. It weren't like that. It was just like, even that was like, oh God, okay, you know. But And even that took, you know, that took that took time. I know you've managed to get into a studio. Um, tell me about that and what you're hoping for in the future, including your online presence. So I'm sort of old school, really. I'm not really necessarily, I suppose I'm the generation just before the sort of, the Instagrams and all of that lot. So I've actually been quite new to online stuff. Prior to COVID, I just had me and my good life, thanks very much. I was out there doing my gigs, working. As I said, I thought I'd cracked it. Um, And I wasn't really someone to be putting loads of photographs online and stuff. It's just not me. It's just like I'm doing life. I'm not reporting on life. I'm doing life. There's a, di- you know what I mean. So yeah. I never sort of really did that, but now I think it really has changed, and COVID's changed that, and um, because so much has gone online, you know, so much has gone online, and so now I realise that I do really need uh, a good online presence. So I'm just starting to build that. So Clubhouse has literally been my saving grace. I'm so grateful for Clubhouse. So my brother introduced me to it. It's my mum's invite, but it's actually my brother introduced me to it. Oh, you know, sis, you've got to get on this app. I was like, oh, in my head, oh, my God, not another bloody app that I have no interest in. Leave me (laughs) alone. I don't care. I have a real life, you know. So the first month, I never really used it. But then about a month later, I just started dipping into different things. And then, I don't know, it was after a week, I just thought, oh, hello. I get it. And of course, because it's all to do with the voice. That's my heaven. That's my, that's my ground, you know, sound, the voice, you know, and, and how much can be detected in one's voice. So we can learn so much about people by their voice, I think and feel. And one of the things I think that really worked for me is the very fact that it's in real time. And it's not just a case of putting a picture up and go, oh, this is me having a cup of tea. Oh, well, this is me walking my dog. It's in the moment. You know the person you're talking to, whether they're for real or not. It's kind of, it has a, a um, an aspect of authenticity about it, I feel. So that's what I liked about it. There was one time when my brother, we were in a room. It was quite a large room, actually. I can't remember that he just said, oh, you want to get this girl up? She's got a really good voice. Anyway, they pulled me up and I just sang on the spot a cappella, um, which is fine. That's what I do. No problem. And then I thought, oh, 
Uh huh. Okay, I'm onto something here. So I just started going into rooms, going into rooms, singing a cappella. So I would do a room, you know, at half seven in the morning. I'd do another one at ten. I'd do another one at eleven. My friend Stella Tudor, who I met on um, uh, Clubhouse, she did this soul cafe every night at nine o'clock. So I would do her. I was kind of like the closing act, as if it was like a, you know, like a back in the day of. Terry Wogan or something like that you know he would interview his guests and then have a a music section so I was like that bit so I did that most nights just sang wherever I could in any of these rooms acapella on the spot and I also put in my bio that you know happy to sing acapella so I knew every single time I plugged into Clubhouse anyone who reads my back just in my mind I thought be prepared to sing because if they call you up and you got that in your bio camera lights action you've got to be on go you know, and it's fine because obviously I've got so much experience. Thank God I'm able to do that, you know. And I've got a club called Soothe Your Soul. And um, I've got Dave Ital, who is London's best session musician, basically. who's worked with everyone, you know, Beyonce, Tom Jones, Take That, Shaka Khan, Nile Rodgers. I mean, the list just goes on is... 100 world tours or whatever and every Sunday 7 till 8 we do a whole mix of acoustic soul numbers so it will either be classic soul or some you know a bit of neo soul a bit of R&B and a sprinkling of jazz but it is my it's mainly soul I do put a few jazz standards in there um because obviously I did study at Guildhall and I just think it's only right and proper that I add jazz on there So, yeah, that's really exciting. And that is going to continue for as long as possible. And the studio session was the first time I played with Dave. Him and Carlos Edwards, who, again, has an incredible biography and has played with, you know, some really, really big names. So there's three of us. We met in a studio and we did uh, four acoustic soul covers. And that was mainly for a soul set. So I have a quintet for my jazz gigs if you like or previous jazz gigs and um i've created the acoustic soul trio specifically to do the soul stuff you know like stevie wonder and marvin gay and uh, shaka khan all that sort of stuff and so we did that for a a showreel uh, in the hope that when we come out of lockdown we're just going to get gigs 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 galore you know because we are all incredible musicians and not only is the music wonderful, but it's just a good vibe. It's a great vibe. If you book me for your event, I'll add value because the vibe that we all put out is just utterly exquisite. You know, we are there to spread love through the vibration of music. And that's another reason why I know it's my God job. Fantastic. You've spoken about your covers, but you've also spoken about your own writing. Tell me more about your own work. Oh, thank you for asking. I have had some dance releases in the past, songs I've written. So I don't play an instrument. I mean, I can get around a keyboard. I have got a keyboard here. So I always need to uh, collaborate. So I do lyrics and melodies. So I'll always need chords. So I've done that in the past and I've written some stuff with a wonderful jazz pianist called Nick Cooper. So we have wrote a few together. I will be continuing to write with him and hopefully uh, writing with Dave. So my aim is to have an album out within the next few months. So I'm writing in the background and I would say it's a mix. There are some dance numbers and there'll be some like jazz and soul, neo soul numbers as well. That's definitely my intention to get my music out there um, from my life experience watch this space and I will be looking at putting the covers on iTunes and Spotify as well because we've got about four of those acoustic soul covers which are they just love that I think they're lovely oh that's beautiful that's so exciting Maxine how can people contact you oh well done thank you very much (laughs) Instagram Maxine Ryan you can DM me on Instagram um you can also go to you'll see my website on there you can email me from my website maxineryan.com i am on uh, youtube so you can leave a message on youtube mainly instagram or um my website and uh watch out for me because i will be coming to soothe your soul 
So, Maxine, do you fancy um, singing a bit of a cappella for us now? Oh, yeah, I'll be delighted. Thank you. Um, I'll do a, a little snippet of a wonderful Bill Withers tune. And what a lot of people don't know about Bill Withers is that he had to overcome a speech impediment. Uh, to speak and there's a wonderful documentary all about that called Still Bill on YouTube a uh, fascinating man fascinating story so I'll give you a little snippet of that so this was written in 1981 by Bill Withers and it is called Just the Two of Us <laughs> I see the crystal raindrops fall And the beauty of it all Is when the sun comes shining through To make those rainbows in my mind When I think of you sometime And I want to spend some time with you Just the two of us We can make it if we try Just the two of us Just the two of us just the two of us building castles in the sky. Just the two of us, you and I. Da 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 Thank you so much. That's just gorgeous. Ah, oh, you're welcome. You're so welcome. Oh, it's been so lovely to talk to you, Maxine. Thanks ever so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. So, yeah, it's just really is wonderful. And thank you so much. And I think you're doing wonderful. And as I said before, it feels like I've known you forever. Um, even though uh, we've only recently met on Clubhouse but it's been an absolute pleasure and uh, thank you for having me and just thank you for all of your support in general Uh, I really do appreciate it Oh you're welcome Maxine, thank you Creativity Found is an Open Stage Arts production If you're listening on Apple Podcasts please subscribe, rate and review If you would like to contribute to future episodes visit ko-fi.com slash creativityfoundpodcast. If you contact any of the artists featured, sign up to their workshops or buy their products, don't forget to mention Creativity Found Podcast. On Instagram or Facebook, follow at Creativity Found Podcast, where you'll find photos of our contributors' artwork and be kept abreast of everything we're up to.